All right, let's get into our end of podcast, what we have all been consuming in the cultural arena. Peter, I understand that you stood in a long line to the bathroom. Do you want to talk about it? No, I I, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't. I don't want to talk about that at all. Okay. Um, but you did go to the movie theater in which there were long lines to the bathroom from what I understand. That's true. I, uh, I saw Dune Part 2 twice, actually, Ooh. once in IMAX and once not in IMAX. And I'm going to see it again tomorrow. Gosh. with Catherine at Maggie Ward because it's awesome. It is. <laughs> Sounds like he's perfectly willing to consider that option. <laughs> I took my wife and she enjoyed it and that was good enough. Um, so I was really thinking about this movie in the context of its sci-fi lineage. In a lot of ways, uh, Dune, the novel, Frank Herbert's 1960s novel, is a response and retort to Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. Um, and then, of course, Star Wars uh, borrows a lot of elements from Frank Herbert's Dune novel, right? Uh, the sandy planet of Tatooine, the giant worm, and um, the Empire Strikes Back, right? And, uh, George Lucas was absolutely using that as part of his kind of collage material, along with like World War II fighter footage and Akira Kurosawa and all of that stuff. And then, of course, um, Star Wars, uh, you know, gave way, right, has sort of become the like 50 percent, 51 percent of pop culture over the last 40 years. I'm exaggerating a little bit for effect here, but it's become this huge force. And now the Dune movies that are out are kind of re-commenting back on Star Wars. But if you go back to where all of this started with Foundation and Isaac Asimov, what was Foundation? Foundation was uh, Isaac Asimov's science fiction retelling of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And you think about how much mind space has been devoted to these science fiction stories over the past decades. And it really turns out that the meme is true. Men cannot stop thinking about the Roman Empire. And so that's what I came away from Dune 2 with. All right. So you liked it? Yeah, it's really good. Um, right. You know, Fremen freedom. I think we're going to need like a, a holiday to celebrate it. Dune-teenth. Oy. Uh, <laughs> Nick. Wow. What did, you, what did you consume that you would like to talk about without getting into Gibbon? Well, I also want to point out that George Lucas uh, stole from Dune the original or the 1984 uh, David Lynch version, uh, which featured Sting wearing a diaper at the end. Um, some of that shows up in Star Wars as well. Um, and I will, I'm forever Dune, the David Lynch Dune, which is that, but that's because I dislike the novel and the, everything that emanates from it. Although I think Peter's absolutely right in his um, categorization and characterization of it. So I uh, will talk, I had two things, but I'll limit one. it to one, Matt. Thank you. Yes, and that is Andrew Hickey's podcast, A History of Rock Music in 500 Songs. Uh, he is up to, almost up to uh, episode 200. These are multi-hour long kind of disquisitions about music going back to the late 30s up through, um, you know, he's up to various points in the early 70s uh, with things. Uh, he just finished a four-part arc that involves the birds and particularly Graham Parsons, uh, which is probably a total of about eight hours. Uh, this is like rock history if D Dan Carlin of Hardcore History was doing it. Uh, these are phenomenal, weird, uh, you know, uh, meditations on how rock music, which is really pop music, uh, in the post-war era came into being. Uh, Hickey is a strange British guy. He sounds like Alan Rickman on a tranquilizer. Um, <laughs> he is, uh, it is just a, f if you care at all about popular music and about how that intersects with all sorts of different creative, commercial, political, and cultural uh, happenings over the past 70 years, a History of Rock Music and 500 Songs is unbeatable. Um, it is truly amazing. And, uh, you know, I am uh, the, the most, the acid test of it is that I listen to episodes about songs and artists that I actively dislike. And I come out uh, seeing the world anew for the first time. It's really a triumph of the podcast form. Um, and I cannot recommend it enough. I think that the Birds and Graham Parsons 
um, tell a story about the um, the possibility, the technological, the cultural, the aesthetic possibilities of the late 60s that was going to fail um, in its inception. Um, and so that particular four episode uh, series is just an incredibly deep rendering of stuff I know very well, and I learned a ton on this. And I think everybody would, uh, you know, it. Regardless of whether you like the the subject matter, you will be amazed that somebody pieced all of this together in a way that is a beautiful, uh, multi dimensional work of art. I highly, highly recommend a history of rock music in five hundred songs by Andrew Hickey. I have had um, more people come up to me in the last two weeks and recommend that podcast than have probably re recommended all podcasts in the history of the world up until that moment. Um, friends in LA who play music and have been in the industry one way or the other for 30 years will say the exact same thing that Nick just said of like, I know everything about X and I learned a whole bunch about X and I can't believe how right they got it and how interesting it was. So um, I can't wait to listen to it myself. Catherine. And there is tons of it. So, you know. Yes. Uh, Catherine, what did you consume? I am going to re-recommend something that Nick has recommended on this podcast in the past, maybe twice even. Um, I'm doing this because I just read it, and so it is fresh for me, but also because maybe you, like me, um, black out while Nick is talking at the end of the podcast, and so you might have missed it, and it would be a shame Back of the line, Catherine. Uh, you did, you did. I also uh, black out. You woke, you woke mm. me back up with the phrase Alan Rickman on tranquilizers, so I, I actually did, I did catch some of that this week. Um, Julia, it is a retelling of George Orwell's 1984 by Sandra Newman. Who you guys, it's so good. It's just so good. Like, speaking of- Like Dune too good? It's Dune too good, Peter. I haven't seen Dune 2 yet. I'm sure I will enjoy it, but I- um, I love a retelling. I am. I. This is already a genre that I'm in for. I will, you know, tell, retell me a Greek myth, retell me a fairy tale, retell me whatever. But um, because 1984 has attained this kind of um, mythological status, right? Like it's just all of us have it engraved in our brains at an early age, and um, so this is subject to that same that same power of the kind of like retelling of a of a myth. The retelling of a foundational story, and and there is a twist which I will not reveal, but um, it's it's fantastic. And if you like me are a lady, um, you might particularly enjoy it because one of the most powerful things about this about this retelling is that it um, it really captured for me the experience that I had but wasn't able to articulate reading 1984, which is like I'm not Winston Smith. I'm not I wouldn't be like this in this world. He is he is sort of too credulous and too uncynical in what I see as typically male ways. And Julia immediately busts through that and then does interesting things with it. Um, so it's short. It's it felt short. Actually, I have no idea how long it was because I read it on Kindle. Um, but it's it's really, really wonderful. Julia, a retelling of George Orwell's 1984. That was a clip from the latest episode of The Reason Roundtable. To watch another clip, click here. To watch the whole episode, click here. And make sure to subscribe to The Reason Roundtable. You'll be glad you did.